here we go, my 30th video on setting up a bind server. Now this one has a PowerPoint, so maybe it'll maybe it'll stick a little bit better. Um, we know what bind does. The last video should have taken care of that. We're resolving um, names to IP addresses. And in this case, we are setting up an authoritative name server to do that for the outside. We are the server portion of it now. Um, first thing to start off with, bind is just a package name. When you install it, you'll say yum install bind. All the rest of the time, it's going to be referred to as name D um, in the same way that Apache is, it calls itself um, HTTPD. Bind should be updated frequently because it has traditionally been a target for hackers to get into networks. Um, Bind is, is the, the biggest DNS server out there by far, um, the same way as kind of Apache is for Linux. And it's had vulnerabilities in the past, but that's the older versions. Um, if you saw a version of Bind, like 5, go up, you won't see too many of them because they would get slaughtered pretty quickly out there on the internet. So bind 9 is what we're on right now and it's, like I say, there's a lot of it out there so it's bound to be fairly stable. But again, you should patch it frequently, uh, number one, just for common sense, um, but two, just to keep it up to date. Um, if you're going to install it, the first thing you should do is check to see if it's already there. RPM-QA pipe um, grep bind to see what it's there. And some stuff will pull up. Um, you'll see bind utilities, you'll see YP bind, which is something completely different. You'll see basically the client end of bind. What we need is the um, server end of bind, and to get that you say yum install bind. After installation, they don't give you any um they don't give you any any sample files the way that Red Hat and CentOS does it. This will be a little bit different if you did it under a different release. But there's always the user shared doc directory and in this case under user shared doc there is a sample directory and in sample you have basically just remade Etsy and VAR so what it's got in Etsy you copy into your actual Etsy recursively and what's in sample VAR name D you can't copy into your VAR name D now your VAR name D won't be there until you install bind which sort of makes sense. So these are your commands and we'll come back to them in a couple of minutes if you need them. It's just a recursive copy of everything that's in these directories and that gives you a starting point if you need a starting point and we do. Main configuration file for bind is as you would figure in the Etsy directory called named.conf. It's an Etsy because it doesn't change a ton. You're going to list here are the domains that I'm responsible for boom and it doesn't change a lot after that. The zone information that has your records about which hosts and things are in your domain will change a good bit especially if it's dynamic and those are, sto are stored in var name D. Var has stuff that changes a good bit. For an example think if you had lots of laptops and you were doing dynamic, D or dynamic DNS and people were coming and going and coming and going and coming and going and you know so var would it used var because it would change quite a bit. Errors are spit just to var log messages by default. If you did a lot of this, you may want to configure it to spit them into some different place, and it has the capability to do that. But just plain Jane bind is going to spit them into messages. Operation. We have a DNS client. Um, he's connected up to the internet. A machine, we'll say, is using this DNS client that could the client could be a server that could be a preferred DNS for somebody um, says host machine one dot example dot com um, the DNS client re receives a request for an IP on example dot com assuming it is not cached it's going to look it up look up the authoritative authoritative name server for example dot com in the hierarchy of DNS just like that last video showed us it's going to go here 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 and find out who is the SOA for example.com. Once it finds it, it's going to contact that DNS server and say, hey, you ever heard of a guy called www on example.com? The DNS client sends a request to the server that has the SOA. Now, in this server, in the, its Etsy directory, it's going to have a name d.conf and it's going to look up and say, well, what do you know? I have example.com. I can tell him something about it. 
Example.com is going to, this is where the zone declaration is. It's just going to be a handful of lines. It's going to point it to var name D to var name D example.com.zone, which would be specified in here. And here's all of your records and information about your zone. It goes and it looks up and says, what did you want? Machine one. Aha, I have that guy. It's found. The DNS servers can send back an authoritative answer about machine1.example.com. Here is your Etsy namedd.conf. A lot of these configuration files, if you go to the trouble of just sitting down and reading them, you'll find just all kinds of gems of information. Comments are a little bit different. They use the C++ style. Anything after a slash slash is considered a comment. Um, I'll say this out of school a little bit. The pound sign still would be considered a a comment and the semicolon is not because the semicolon is considered the end of a line. Sections are grouped. I didn't have the actual end because this file is so large. Um, sections are grouped into stanzas by curly braces. So this would be the options stanza and then further down here you'll see the the ending curly brace. Okay, your options section. These are going to be options that are for the entire thing. The ports you're going to use, um, statistics, da -da -da -da, different things to, to measure it with. The thing that, that's going to get us, that's going to be most important to us is this one. Directory var name D. That specifies where the zone files are held. It also says if you just stick a name out here without any kind of path before it, it's just going to assume that it's going to be in var name D. So this right here would be found in slash var slash name D slash data this. So that just gives you basically a baseline unless you specify a path name. If you have something that starts with a slash that's an absolute absolute path name and that wouldn't apply. All right. All bind nine zones are in a view. I'm just going to forgive me for reading a little bit of this. Allows different zones to be uh, served. You can have different things for different options. It's the concept of of a view. If the word view is not found, that means that whatever zones you list are going to be given to everybody. So you can get rid of the concept of views just by not including the word view in your namedd.conf. That's the way it's always been done in the the like eight and earlier versions of bind and that's okay but at that point you need to start looking at having two DNS servers because it's like I said it's a play, favorite place to get hacked and you don't want your internal information being spit out onto the internet for everybody and that's what it's saying if it contains any view clause um, then all zones must be in a view so you don't have like a default view you've got three views the way that we've got it set up here. You have localhost, internal, and external. And we'll see those see those in just a minute. So if you have view anywhere in there, you've got to respect all of the views. It's a all or nothing kind of thing. So it is recommended to start off using views to avoid having to restructure your configuration in the future. This is just good practice. This is where it's going to go. It's not coming back. Um, it just makes more sense with defense in depth. You want every level of your network defending itself somehow or another. Kind of like in the army. If you're a cook, you're a soldier first. You shoot a gun. If you're a pilot, you're a soldier first. You learn how to shoot a gun. Everybody in the in the outfit is going to know something about security. The local host resolver. That's our first one. This is for the machine itself. This is for the machine you're sitting at, local host, that is running name D. Um, whatever is listed in this stanza, and I actually managed to get the whole stanza on the screen at one time, so you can see the uh, the beginning and the ending curly brace. Um, it's just for the local machine. Localhost revolver, resolver. I knew I'd say revolver eventually. Just thing by the local machine. Root hints is included in every view. What did root hints do? Told you where that dot at the beginning of the DNS of the internet is, right? So that's going to be in all zones. RFC nineteen twelve sets up your stuff for if you point to localhost.local .local domain is going to point to just the local machine and those are all listed in an external file in Etsy 
named the RFC 1912 dot zones. So to answers to use your DNS to answer stuff about your local machine because a lot of processes are going to point to localhost. So this way you can set your Etsy resolve dot conf to 127.0.0.1 and it doesn't matter if it's in your Etsy hosts or not. All the stuff that's about local domain is going to go locally. If you ping fred.localdomain it's going to be local. So that's what the RFC 1912 is about. This will be the only place that you include 1912. Any other place it wouldn't make sense. Um, if you were a machine on this network somewhere and asked for localhost at example.com it's not going to make sense. It's apples and oranges. The internal view, this is going to be for machines that are on the same network as your network card. It's going to look at your IP address and it's going to know with your IP address and your subnet mask the guys that are in its local network. Um, if you looked back in the back, instead of local nets, it said local host. This is local nets that it's going to match. Match destinations, match clients. Um, and it tells you. This is for local machines. Notice root hints is included. That makes sense. It's got to be in all of them. Notice RFC 1912 is not included. It's there, but it is commented out. And it tells you you shouldn't serve these to non-local host clients. Okay, this is, we're still in internal. And it's showing you this is our first authoritative zone, my.internal.zone just as a little example of a zone declaration. And it's telling you anytime that um, anything that you have in internal is pretty much automatically going to have to be in local host resolver. It'd be weird to say I'm going to serve this to my local network I don't want to know about it myself. That's just going to cause confusion. So anytime that you add something to internal just as good practice go ahead and load it on into local host resolver as well. It'd be a really odd situation that you wouldn't want to do that. Um, this is your first zone. Notice you've got curly braces. Curly braces enclosing the whole thing. A semicolon after the curly braces. Um, this would be for anything that was sent to dot my internal dot zone. That's where the zone is declared. And we'll look at that again in just a minute. So if you looked for host one dot my internal dot zone, this is where the answer is going to be found. It's going to go to this file in var name D go look it up and it's going to return information about it. Notice that host1 isn't listed anywhere in here. It's a zone or it's a, a host record in this file here. Okay, this just points to it and gives it some options. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start this and say it again a couple more times. You've got to really pay attention to syntax in bind. That's one thing that really knocks students in the head when they first try to set this up. Um, not having quotes around something not having a semicolon after your quotes, not having a semicolon at the end of every line. It's very, very, very picky about its syntax. And you will find that quickly. Um, the way that Red Hat CentOS sets this up, I think it's a little bit funny. But this is your DDNS key, dynamic DNS. It's saying, okay, if anybody is going to be updating records, on this, we don't want just anybody in the world come pumping crap into our our DNS. So, whoever is going to be going to do it, we want them to have this password right here. And to generate a hash, you've got to use this program to do it. And see, they've put the cute little comment in here: use this to generate a TSIG key. And it's saying that it's supposed to be a hash. If you leave it like this, name D's not going to start. It's going to say, "What's this garbage?" and it'll die right there. So what you have to do is to go out, run the command it's telling you to run, just read the thing, it'll spit out some output and then you put that between your quotes. The hardest thing is remembering to get it right between the quotes, no spaces, no nothing. There you go. There's your original text, just a little snippet. What you do is go out to a prompt. I do it in another terminal so it's easy to cut and paste. You run that command and it spits out one thing big long hash. You go in and paste it in, paste the big long hash in where it used to say da 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 use this TSIG keys. Once you've done that you're ready to go forward. 
Your external view, that's our last view. This is going to be, what does it say? Serve to external clients, um, addresses that are not on your directly attached LAN interfaces. To simulate this in the lab, um, usually whip out a router and put people on a different network to see what resolves. And they give you a warning contains entries just for your web and mail servers. You'd have to be very, very careful about what you put in external zone. This is what you're showing to everybody. You don't want records in there about, well, here's my SQL server, and here's all this other stuff. Here's the boss's machine name and IP address. Here is, here's you just a complete zone transfer um, to footprint my entire network and come in and tear me all to pieces. So in this tiny little zone, you would just have just a couple of very selected records and generally that's just going to be your web and mail servers what else is somebody else going to hit on your network unless you have something specific and funky running if you had an FTP server for something specific you could list that creating a zone this is declaring a zone this is in Etsy named d.conf again to pound it home punctuation is a big deal and that's where students mess up students and the instructor I might add messes up a bunch there is the name of the domain to be resolved notice it doesn't have a www or anything in front of it it is just the domain name with its top level domain you got three different types of domain master slave and hence hence is a very specific thing that's saying go find me the root of the DNS of the internet um, Masters, we talked about these a little bit before. Masters can be updated. Slaves aren't updated. They get zone transfers. They both can be queried. So those are your three types that you can have in there. The next thing that it has is an example of where, where your zone file is. Where's all the rest of the information about this guy? And example.com.zone, we're going to assume that the directory statement is up above in the global options to say it's pointed to var name D. Who updates this record? Now by default it sticks a none in there. Let me point out that there's a space right there. And if it's not there, you'll choke. But anyway, who do you want to update and to put in records for this zone? If you leave it at none, then it's you as the administrator. is the only person that can go in and add records. A little tedious, but another thing that you can do is specify an IP address of a DHCP server or maybe of something else to let it um, update your zone. In some networks, um, if it's very, very trusted, you could let the machines themselves update their DNS records. Windows will let you do that if you trust your, your machines. I like the idea better of just having a single IP address in here to allow it to update. Again, this goes, you could, you could bring up the point that everything needs to have a static IP address. If your DHCP didn't have a static IP address, that would fail right there. Again, there's a space right there. Where to place your zone? Once you've got it figured out to say, here's what I want to do. I want to set up a master zone. I want to point to this zone file. You can put them directly in etsynamed.conf. That's the way it's always been done. Problem is, every zone that you work with is going to have to be put in there. Right? In the old days, you didn't have views. You could slap it in there and then go do your zone file and you were cool. What if you administer 10 different zones? Then you've got to list them each at least twice in Etsy named d.conf. So that right there is an administration hassle, just doing extra work. Uh, and what really gets to be a hassle is you have to make sure the one that's in internal is the same as the one that's in localhost um, resolver. And if you're like me, you'll go through and find it and say, oh, there it is, and fix it, and never think to fix the second one. Then you've got confusion between your zones, although it would still work. So to keep from listing them repetitively in namedd.conf, you can define a separate file. Remember I talked about the 1912. You had an include statement that went out and fetched some zones. Well, um, you can use an include statement in var namedd.conf. That should be namedd.conf there and there. But anyway, you can specify them in there and just go out and fetch like a little assistant file. And you can call it whatever you want to. Um, I'm going to set up more dot zones. I think in another video or an example I called it stuff dot zone. 
But what this is is a list of additional zones that I administer. And I've got example.com and chicken.com. And master, there's the file to go get. Don't allow anybody to update it. This is like the simplest example. Then what you can do in namedd.conf, this is all namedd.conf. Here is my local host view, and here is my internal view. I just hashed out some stuff just so you can see what I'm doing. It's got include namedd root hints. Well, you can just come in after that and say include etsy more.zones because I just created that file I just showed you. And the same thing in internal. So I've got it in localhost and I've got it in internal. And then when I edit the file, it winds up being changed in both places. Back to the operation, DNS server looks for it in namedd.conf. Then if, it, if it's in another zone, this effectively at runtime would get slapped into this. So this may be a tiny bit misleading, but this actually winds up being all one big thing. When it's in RAM, it includes all of these in with all of these. But conceptually, this is what's happening. It goes and finds a machine, and we have the same sort of thing. That way, they're, they're still found. It's just a little bit easier to administer. Now, we've talked about namedd.conf. We told it where it needs to point. Now, let's talk a little bit about we're in var named now with the zone files. This is where all of your record information is going to be. Um, to help yourself, when you did that copy from sample in user share doc, it gave you a local domain dot zone which gave you an example zone file. It gave you a jumping off point. Zone files have to be readable by name the user. The way we install it, that happened automatically, but um, if you were root and you copied it, they would pop in as root. When you did this, copy local domain dot zone to Stephen domain dot zone as root. Uh, root would be the owner of the new one, and depending if root had a funky U mask, name D could wind up not being able to read it, which would be bad. There is our example um, zone file. That should be example dot com dot zone because it's in var name D. Time to live, TTL. This is a default time to live for records. So when another server gets it, it can tell it, this is pretty stable, you can keep it for a while, a high number. Or you could say, this is not real stable, it's been changing a whole lot, let me give you a low number, and if it times out, just come back and ask me again. Um, specifies it. You can specify it per record if you want to do that. But this is a catch-all if it's not specified and 86400 is 60 days, which is a pretty long time to keep a record. Apparently we're pretty optimistic about our records. This is a single record. Notice that it runs da -da 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 from here to here, and it's declaring itself as start of authority. Chicken.com. On ours, it's replaced with an at sign. They replace all these with like the least thing that you can put in there and um, when, you, when you copy that sample the way that it's set up, and I, it, it winds up being a little bit harder to understand and to, to demonstrate. But anyway, this would be the zone that we're talking about. This is the chicken zone. And I liked changing this one out. It, it was the amper or the at sign, and I put this just to kind of give you some visual um, reaffirmation of which zone you're working on. Um, it must end in a dot, and somehow or another I left it off there. But that should be chicken dot com dot. Anything that doesn't end in a dot is going to get chicken.com splattered at the end of it. So the way this is written, and I'll change it, chicken.com dot chicken.com. So that would have to be fixed. IN, we'll talk more about these IN records here in a minute. It means internet. It's just a, a type of record. And SOA declares start of authority, saying I am the dude to respond. I am the dude to ask. Localhost that is the name of the primary DNS, for example, .com. And since we're setting it up right here, localhost is fine. You could also have mail.chicken.com dot if you wanted to be fancier with it and then define it down here. Root. Again, this is the simplest. Since we are on this local machine, it says send stuff to root, and it would send it to root on the local machine. But if you had somebody else administering this DNS, you could put in, this This actually is an email address in a funky format. Since the at means something different, 
it would be root.abtech.edu where normally you'd see an at sign. You replace the at sign with a dot. So that way you can have it email in your um, cell phone. In between the two um, parentheses are a list of options for the slaves. The slave servers that will come up and ask stuff. And you even get some computer geek silliness in here with 42 from um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, even got, a, got him, a, got him a, a credit in there. But what this serial number is, it's the master talking to the slaves about what revision that it's using. If the slave sees that the master has a 43 and he's only got a 42, it's going to say, oh, time for a zone transfer. Need some more information. Start the service. Service name D start. If you have bad errors, it'll stop and it'll kick them out to the screen right there and you can work on them. Errors are pretty good. This is a pretty big program. Been out there. A lot of people work with it. So consequently, you have a lot of good errors. Bad thing is, if a single domain has some syntax errors or some problems, the rest of name D at times can start. And you'd have to look through var log messages to see, oh, this started wrong for this, this one domain. Something's wrong with it. So even though you get an OK message, parts of it can be screwed up, but it's not a, a fatal screw up. After the uh, service name D start, I've done a tail 50 uh, var log messages and scratched out what's important to us. Basic stuff says it's starting, found a CPU using Etsy name D.com for what it's listening on, the ports. Then you get into some more in interesting information. It's going through and loading its zones. Remember localhost resolver? That's what it's doing first. It's going and picking up all of these, um, and it's giving the serial number. This is a different type of serial number, which actually makes more sense. It's got year and month and day and then two fields. So that way you could have an, a hundred updates to your DNS a day, and that would still work. This makes a whole lot more sense to me than whipping a 42 out of a silly book. Anyway, that works. All these are localhost resolver that have come in. Doot, doot, doot. These are your internal zones. They all say internal. It went through and read all of those in. Um, you could look through and there shouldn't be a 1912 in here where there was a 1912 above. Now this references back a little bit to localhost resolver but notice that chicken.com and example.com both loaded in and they appear to be happy. Zone chicken.com in localhost loaded with a 42 and in internal it loaded with a 42. If you had a syntax error, more than likely both of them would splatter or both of them are going to work, whichever. External zone loads and it's announcing that it is running. Good to go. Okay, this is where I got on the, the PowerPoint. But we talked yesterday about um, preventing zone transfers. And the one thing that we had to do, and I'm just going to click on this and, and go back. When you had an example of a zone, right here it is. I actually found it, believe it or not. You've got your zone, master, and allow update. What I wanted to show you was as a client, once this is up, up and running, you can do a host-la and point and say example.com and point it to this DNS and you will get a complete zone transfer which is not so pretty good. So what you would want to do is to go in and do allow up, allow transfer allow transfer and the way I'm setting it up right now with just me, you'd do an allow transfer on both of these. I think the other video I actually showed this that I did allow transfer none on one and not the other. This would prevent a, a zone transfer by just anybody. In the real world when we get into doing master and slave you'll see allow transfer and then your slaves IP address right there because he's the only guy you want doing a, a zone transfer. Alright so hopefully that helped you some with setting up a server in